How wonderful to have you with us for the Orthodox Christian Mission Presents. I'm Judith Irene Mate, your host and producer, and also an Orthodox missionary and a trained theologian in Protestant seminaries and by our wonderful uh, mentor and OCA bishop up in Canada, from whom we learned so much Archbishop Plaza was and is Serbian and he always says he learned his theology at his grandmother's knee. That's the way in the old country. Same with the priesthood. The priests were given that assignment by the villages and were assigned to be an associate priest if they were worthy and if people were uh, satisfied with their comportment with their faith, with their steady faith and their love of God and of their neighbors and of their family. This is the way it has been from the time of the apostles. We'll speak more about the problems that come with seminaries and with automatically giving priests charge at a very young age and without proper uh, training and screening, giving our young graduates from seminary the responsibility of managing a parish and people's lives. Today, during this time in America, we're seeing a vital and violent uh, winnowing out of those who are truly American and unified in spirit under our God, under our flag, uh, being loyal to the country that has allowed them freedom of expression and worship and speech and freedom to be an entrepreneur. If you have ever been in Europe and spoken with Frenchmen, with, uh, with Britishers, you will know that they are hampered by a class system. In Britain, since the time, 1066, when the Franks came in, there was an imposition of an oppression by the Norman Latin Church and its appointees and rulers over the Saxon and Anglo people. It also extended to the Irish, the Celtic people in Ireland and Wales. Very oppressive for them. We are so blessed to be free of this. That's why we fought a revolution in 1770s, was to throw off the yoke of taxation, to throw off the oppressive society of church and state wedded together. We have today a war. It began with words, but friends, words always, especially violent words, will always bear fruit in violent actions. That's just the way it is. The devil starts a fire with hatred and violence toward others. And eventually that hatred and violence will act out in murder. That's why the Lord has warned against anger, that it will end in murder. So we have the imposition of a class warfare now. If you're the wrong color, if you're the wrong uh, you have the wrong uh, job, if you're an entrepreneur, you've started your own business, uh, you're rather on your own, you obey the law, uh, you do things properly by the law, insofar as we can, none of us is perfect, of course. If you do these things, uh, you are considered to be uh, wrong because you're going along with a white society that's imposing itself upon minorities. We are governed by laws, agreed to 
by the various colonies and each of us who is born in America will grow up loving this and uh, flourishing under the rule of law because it means my neighbor even if there are evil people in my neighborhood they will not be allowed to infringe upon my freedoms our constitution gives me guards around my personal well-being and my personal freedom this we must value because not every country has this in fact very few Switzerland perhaps is the most stable uh, in as far as leadership and governance uh, among the Europeans. Now I want you to be aware of certain signals. If you're wondering where these people are from and what their intention is, Watch their actions. When you see a fist clenched and raised, go back and look at the Bolsheviks. That's exactly what was used. Or any Marxist uh, society in Africa, South Africa, Nelson Mandela, the fist, not only that, openly the hammer and sickle of Russia because the Russians were fomenting a lot of this when they were the Soviet Union under a Marxist dictatorship. So when you see the fist raised, our football players, for heaven's sake, raising a fist to the sky, remember God is dwelling in the sky. They're raising their fist to Almighty God, not just to our nation. Remember that nations are put in place and given the right to rule a proper leadership by the permission of our God. Romans 13 and 14 especially tell us to pray for our rulers, no matter if we agree with them specifically in their policies or not. If they're duly elected, electoral college, also, which guards against the mob rule that we are seeing so much of in the streets. If you see this, you will have to be aware that there are other forces that are interested in anarchy in order to upset the rule of law by properly elected leaders. Let's speak a little bit more about this. look at societies that have gone Marxist, communist, we ascertain certain signals about its genesis as it's taking root in a society. One of them is that it starts among the university students. We have naive young people uh, who are under the sway of a charismatic professor or two or three and have not yet been trained in reasoning. They're very liable to move emotionally to whatever cause they're called to. This is where we get ideology. No matter the help or hindrance to personal freedom and the freedom of my neighbors, I have an ideology that can steamroll any freedoms and any borders uh, and barriers to my exercising uh, bullying tactics, uh, stealing the freedoms of others around me. So we see the Antifa movement, anti-fascist, well, these are fascists. Let me tell you another secret, raised fist, yes, and they will call themselves the opposite of what they are. This is the devil's whole method. We'll see, uh, this is a scriptural church, for instance, in the Christian community. And it will be anything but a scriptural church. We'll see signs, Grace Church. 
I always say to my husband, Father James, this is for sure a law church because what they're saying is what they need. And that doesn't mean they have it yet. So if they're saying we're a grace church, that means they need it. They need grace to bring them out of whatever they're into. So I suppose we could say that's their prayer. Antifa, anti-fascist, is in reality a fascist movement in disguise. That means thugs from outside our country who are forcing their own agenda on our people, abusing the freedom that is given to us by our Constitution and by the Bill of Rights. So just be aware of what's happening. I'm sure you are. You're very wise. If you're Orthodox Christian in reality, you're already halfway there. You know also that reason must prevail. The Lord says, come, let us reason together. He gave us free will based on our reasonable choice and on the impulse of pure love, channeling our emotions to those heavenly perspectives. Instead of anger, we have zeal for the Lord. Instead of hatred, we have a great love as is given to us when we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to take over our lives and our hearts, granting me the mind of Christ as I always pray, and a heart that is filled with His love. We need big hearts in these days because in order to overcome evil, we have to overcome it with goodness. And in that case, I have to overlook the evil that is done by people and realize that it's not the person, it is the enemy of our souls to steal, kill, and destroy whatever work of the Lord is in us. We will not allow that. We are the people of God, the holy, orthodox, and apostolic faith which will shine in these latter days, stabilized, by the holy apostles' teachings passed down, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, to trusted elders. Let's talk a little bit more about the spiritual ramifications now of things that are happening in the Orthodox Church itself. Now, we always say, the end is in the beginning. Take a look at the early church. Take a look at what was really preeminent in the problem facing the early church. Read the book of Acts, chapter 8. In the pagan society around the early church, you had very much a magic of paganism. If they said the magic words, that would automatically bring about whatever they spoke. The oracle at Delphi was one of them. Uh, they got false prophecies. There were false tongues. I mean, all these magical things that the devil put in place in order to cast a bad light upon the true gifts of the Holy Spirit. Reading chapter 8 of the book of Acts of the Apostles, we see Simon the Magician. Simon the Magician pretended to be Christian and converted. He was baptized even. Remember this. Baptism is not magic. It takes our will to continue in the way of faith as we have planted in us in baptism. Water it with your tears and repentance and humbleness 
and it will grow and create a new creation that will reflect the person of the God-man in whose image we are created. We must grow into his likeness in our lives. And this is an ongoing process. It's not automatically once saved, always saved. I have to grow into Christ. This is what the Orthodox faith of the Apostles teaches us to do. Prayer, worship, transforming our lives. As we read Holy Scriptures with understanding the commentaries from the early fathers, Saints Basil, Gregory, Gregory Palamas, later on in history, John Chrysostomus, many of the patriarchs of Jerusalem, Kirill, Jerusalem. I mean, Kirill, patriarch of Alexandria, the leaders and also the humble ones that taught by the All Holy Spirit how to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we continue the book of Acts as chapter 29 and 30, as his life extends through us into the end times until finally he will come to harvest his church. Remember, right along with the wheat and the tares, they will come together. Remember the big net as we have this Sunday's gospel that is to overflowing, is breaking the nets because many things were in those nets which did not belong, and the angels would have to sort them out. This is what is happening even today in a preliminary step as we see many, many unholy things that have, that have weaseled their way into the holy faith through the bishops and the priests that are not really paying attention. Let's speak about several of these. As we spoke about the early church and the Gnostic heresy that Simon the Magician began a mixture of magic words and a false idea of, of the soul being the only important thing and whatever I wanted to do I could do in my body. So Simon the Magician had a concubine that was a false prophet with him and uh, his followers would have many concubines. This was just part of the profligacy of the early Gnostic uh, movement. However, there was a two-pronged Gnosticism going on. As the church became less persecuted, you had people wanting to go into martyrdom, what we call a green martyrdom or a white martyrdom, which means they weren't actually killed, martyred, but they set themselves apart to be only for the Lord in a self-consecration of only for the Lord, like a living martyrdom. Full of joy, by the way. When we have the presence of the Lord, we ask the Lord Jesus Christ who dwells within us from baptism. We ask him to fill us to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. He has prepared a table before me, says Psalm 23. And he has given me a cup of salvation. He anointeth me with oil. My cup overflows. We need that in this time. We need the banquet and the cup of anointing from the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two prongs, as we said, to this Gnosticism, both of whom disregard the body. One is profligate, meaning I can do anything I want in the body. It's not a real sin because it doesn't matter. My soul is being purified. That's the only thing that matters. 
Do you notice there's no resurrection of the body as is taught in real Christianity? Now the second prong of that is a super asceticism, hyper monasticism I would call it, where I kill off the body. This is very common among religious people. Religious types understand that they can't be openly sinful. They're after the acceptance of those around them. So they will take on a hyper-piety, a super-Christian, even though they're secretly feeding pride and arrogance to unbelievable portions, and I've seen this. So you have a hyper-asceticism. I really fast days and days, all of this. And you say, how can that be bad? We're supposed to fast. Everything in moderation some of us being old and tottering, as the Psalms say, can't really fast, otherwise we can't get off our couches. We need the strength of whatever meat or whatever uh, in moderation we eat to strengthen us as God gives us to eat. So we have these two prongs, one super ascetical, so you see them real skinny. The belts are cinched up and there's practically nothing there. And you see the super profligates, the success gospel, for example, where God says, I'm a king's kid. They'll take certain verses of scripture. And I haven't seen this really in the Orthodox faith, although we have some that would live with lots of bangles and spangles and maybe beautiful chains with uh, the icons of the Incarnation on them if they're priests and bishops. Maybe there's a little bit of that vanity going on. Uh, in other words, they don't think that it is bad. We have to realize that a lot of what we think is for the Lord, we have to measure and make sure it's not for us and for our glory. So we have this Gnostic problem. In Orthodoxy, the ascetical type of movement. Now the reason you can tell if it is unhealthy and much of it is, is if there's a denigration of marriage. In Christianity, Christ loved, because of Adam and Eve creating them out of one flesh, he loved the two in one flesh of marriage. It was a symbol and picture of the bride of Christ, his church, coming, becoming one with Christ, our bridegroom. Marriage is a very important external symbol of what he has planned for the church, what he has planned for his bride, the church. We see him at the marriage feast of Simon the, uh, Simon, uh, the Zealot, his apostle. That's where the miracle at Cana happened. Beautiful. That was his blessing upon the people that were there celebrating this wonderful wedding. So we cannot denigrate the body. We have many that are influenced by an Augustinian uh, paganism, Neoplatonism is the official word, where the body doesn't mean anything and the soul is everything as usual. And in this Gnosticism, they turn up their nose to marriage, sexuality, anything like that that is impure. And the woman is seen as a seductress. Of course, this is very dangerous. It denigrates one half, first of all, of all humanity. And it makes the woman guilty for the lust of the man. This happens in Islam. They hate women. 
they'll take two or three wives and they'll hate every one of them because it's a picture of their own lust they can't control. It's a weakness in them they don't like. So anyway, this is the hypermonasticism that is coming into parishes chiefly from Father Ephraim who purports to be from Mount Athos whom some say was dismissed from Mount Athos. Now I want you Greek Orthodox especially to realize not everyone who's a disciple of the saintly Father Joseph for instance in Mount Athos is necessarily holy and pure like he is. We have our own free will. Some of the disciples will be good and have the grace and the humility to follow him and some of the disciples of a holy elder will not be. They'll want to make up their own religion because the other way is too hard. So they'll take on all the externals, super fasting, super uh, penances given in confession, uh, always casting out demons. Now our saintly father Perfurius, along with Elder Emilianos, teach a wonderful balance. Marriage is holy and monasticism is holy insofar as we give our lives to Christ and serve those in our communities, either our marriage community or our monastic community. They're equal. Let's get that very firmly in our mind. The body is equally holy and a servant of the soul. So the body will receive the reward that the soul receives because it was obedient to God as the soul and the Holy Spirit within that soul directs it. That's why the relics of the saints are so important as a testimony to the holiness of the body and the final resurrection of the body, reflecting and energized by the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, you'll find many Protestants that will tell you it's not important if the Lord rose bodily. That's because they're Gnostics. They don't know it. They don't realize the importance of the body and the importance of prayer as the body participates in prayer. The importance of the Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion, as the body participates and is fed along with the soul. So let's be sure that we understand as Orthodox Christians we must avoid anyone who is foisting a monastic disdain for marriage onto married parishioners. They will try and separate as Father Ephraim does in his Florence monastery. They will accept a married priest, but then the woman has to go away. His wife has to go into another monastery. So they will both be holy that way. That's a denigration of marriage. That's disobeying the command to love your wife, to leave your mother and father and live, become one flesh with your wife and honor her and keep her. Ephesians 5, the wife must honor the husband, the husband must honor and care for and love the wife. So let's make sure that marriage, monastic, are both holy ways of life and that it is the love of Christ energizing both of these ways of life. As I love my neighbor with his love, both in marriage and in the monastic life. Now there are 
many forces trying to divide the Orthodox churches among us. Divide and conquer. When we are divided, we are weaker. When we are unified, we have the force of Christ within us and the Holy Trinity. We must stay united in the faith, not in the country of origin. The country of origin, Greece or Russia or whatever, Bulgaria, Romania, lovely people, are, is, can be a basis, but we can't stay there. We must discover Christ within the holy faith. Otherwise, we'll simply pass on the ethnic culture and not the faith in Christ, which is the treasure within. So we'll pass along the shell without the treasure within. We'll pass along the savings box perfectly empty, but looking like it's Greek or Russian. Without faith in Christ, which is the treasure of our lives, we will be torn asunder, as many churches are, as the parish councils argue about money, as the Ephraimites, people following this false monk from Mount Athos, as people will try and impose their false piety, super holiness, so-called, super monastic way of life, on married people. There are enough uh, ways for the Lord to, to make us humble as we give the gospel out here in the world. We don't have to denigrate ourselves to a thousand prostrations. We are doing uh, prostrations many times as we serve others that are around us and the way to serve them is the gospel. We serve up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, first of all, the Lord loves you, dear one. Do you know that Jesus Christ loves you and has loved you from the time you were created and is waiting for you to choose him because he gives you free will? Choose him and live. Choose life and live. Uh, in my own case, look how he's brought me from near death into life. The Lord is endlessly praised and sanctified and glorified as he makes everything around us bloom and he makes us flourish. First of all, by the All Holy Communion as we receive him and ask to be strengthened, that our new creation given to us in baptism will grow and be strong and that the old man will die, as St. Paul so beautifully says in Romans 5 and 6, and Romans 8 as the Holy Spirit, the spiritual man, is the victor over the way of flesh. Now remember, flesh, as St. Paul teaches, is not equal to the body. Flesh is the mind. As the Lord Jesus said, out of the heart of flesh, will come every evil thought. This generates this old man, this fallen man, under the sway of mortality and corruption passed along by Adam. He will generate within me lustful thoughts, ambitious thoughts to take over positions of leadership. He will generate within me covetousness, jealousy, envy. Everything, everything that will destroy my love and relationship in peace with my neighbor and my family and with my God. famous Latin
Latin father is, is Augustine, and he's yeah. given a lot of space and has had a lot of influence. Um, but my understanding is that the, that, uh, the Orthodox Church, or at least some would, they would not venerate him as a father, or at least elevate him to the point where he has been. What, what's your take on Augustine? Um, you know, well, the, 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 um, actually the popes didn't accept him either at the beginning because they realized that there were some serious uh, things wrong in what he taught. It was, you know, if it hadn't been for Prosper of Aquitaine and some of these other enthusiasts, uh, Augustine might not have been considered such a great father in the West either. Uh, I know that a lot of Orthodox people, particularly in the epoch when we have a lot of converts in the West, but also under the influence of ecumenism, have begun to accept Augustine, although throughout history, uh, Augustine did not appear in the Orthodox Church calendar. The Russians would refer to him as Blessed Augustine, but never Saint. And uh, uh, so there are a lot of misunderstandings about it. Augustine's whole, the whole ethos of what Augustine teaches is really is pure Neoplatonism. And many of the uh, major heresies in the West, or what we would consider heresies, do come from Augustine. Sometimes, um, sometimes Tertullian was a precursor of them, but he was a lawyer also. Um, I, I just give you a few examples that Augustine, the idea of double predestination, the idea of original sin, as, that is original guilt, really, the inheritance of personal inheritance by everyone born of, of guilt for Adam's sin, um, the idea of purgatory and limbo, of course, and the filio came, really came from, from Augustine. Um, I mean, there are several other problems with his teachings, and no, no major writer in the ancient church ever diverged so radically from the writings of the Orthodox Fathers, as did Augustine. But he was a brilliant writer, he wrote beautifully, and he had a lot of powerful, beautiful things to say. Consequently, he had a huge influence that it's rather tragic that he did, in a way. And I know a lot of people are irritated by that because they consider Augustine you know, to be even greater than the Cappadocians or something. But um, uh, when um, the great pillar of orthodoxy, uh, Mark of Ephesus, was passing from this life, the uh, first person to become patriarch after the, the conquest by the by the Ottomans was um, uh, Gregory. Um, well, actually, it was George, but became Greg Gregus Scholasticus. Uh, he went to see uh, Mark of Ephesus, and Mark of Ephesus warned him against Augustine and the writings of Augustine. Before that, um, um, uh, Gregory had been a little bit influenced by Augustine. But uh, Mark, in his debates with the cardinals in, at the Council of Florence somewhat earlier, had realized that Augustine was the problem. And in in, uh, in, the, in the schism, ultimately, was because of the, a lot largely because of the teachings of Augustine. So that's and people should explore that rather than uh, just uh, responding with their emotions, but actually explore it in some depth. Saint Mark stands and says, "We obeying the apostles who have prohibited Jewish unleavened bread for use in the Eucharist." proclaim that what is used in the services of the Latins is false, and we say any addition to the creed is false. And for us, the Pope is one of the patriarchs, not a vicar of Christ over all. And so, brethren, he says at his final statement, flee from the Latins and from any communion with them. They are false apostles, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, in another place, those who serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, says St. Paul, even serve their own belly. On his deathbed before many witnesses, he said, I am absolutely convinced that the further I stand from the Pope and those like him, the nearer I am to God and to all the saints, and to the degree I separate myself from them, I am in union with the truth and with the Holy Fathers. 
I am likewise convinced that those who stand with them stand far from the blessed teachers of the truth and from the holy church of Christ. Those coming into orthodoxy, you must lay aside any eyes that will have you see carnally because there will be much to see. You'll see people bickering, you'll see everything just like in human families. We must go after the faith, find people that are serious about living the holy faith. People that read Elder Emilianos, Elder Porphyrios, these wonderful elders staying away from Gnostic pseudo-monks who are falsely giving an ascetical and hyper-monastic teaching. God has blessed the life around us, our human life. It is not to be disdained. We have marriage. We have relationship within marriage, making the husband and wife come closer together binding us together with children and with their love that flows to God as he gives his love in return. And as Psalm 79 so beautifully says, we ask the Lord to bless, O Lord, bless and perfect the vine which thou hast planted. When you have the bishop visit you, he will say, O Lord, bless this vine which thou hast planted. And he will sign the sign of the cross as the blessing upon his people, as he is the overseer of the perfecting and praying for the grace from the Holy Spirit to be upon us, every member, even the smallest child. For this we pray, not judging others in the church, Remember, even if there is open evil, to shun it, as St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, do not fellowship with them. Even if they're at our love feast, just don't fellowship with them. Stay away. But cling to those who love the Lord. Get the treasure of the faith, receive the holy mysteries, and mind your business along with those who also love the Lord and are called according to his calling and grace. We pray this for you. We pray this for our little mission and for all the outreach we make as we pray for miracles to attend the kingdom of God. We pray for this for you, dear ones, as the Holy Spirit overcomes every evil force and every evil work of the enemy among us. May it be so, O Lord, crown this, your mission and your people, with works that will bring the rejoicing crowd with us to the house of God, to paradise. Amen. For the glory of Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, well, each uh, one of those early fathers had something rather specific. Ignati the God-bearer, for example, um, having been consecrated by the apostles and uh, living in their time, uh, describes exactly what the structure and life of the church was at that time. Uh, that's why it's important that he tells us that where the bishop and the congregation of the faithful are gathered together for the Eucharist, the whole fullness of the Catholic Church is there at that time, at that place. St. Uh, Saint, uh, Irenaeus is, is extremely important to us because it's from him that we learn about some of the early struggles of, of the Church for orthodoxy of faith uh, against various Gnostic groups and various 
semi-Jewish as, as well as semi-Christian Gnostics. And it, it's from him that we find the, the, the refutation of these distortions. For example, the idea that the human body is, is evil or the enemy of the soul. Ignatius, like, like all the Holy Fathers who wrote against Gnosticism, uh, exposes that teaching as false. Um, he gives us a clearer understanding of the apostolic understanding uh, itself about Christ and his work. For example, there was speculation about why Christ wanted the chalice to be removed from him in, in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Ignatius, among others, uh, tells us it's not possible that Christ was fearful of the crucifixion, because he certainly knew who he was. But uh, his, his, his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane was his moral suffering for over humanity or for humanity. And so we get uh, from Ignatius, uh, uh, when we see the, the, the picture of these struggles in the early Christian church, and Ignatius giving us what we would consider an orthodox response, then we see uh, how the earliest Christians actually understood the gospel as opposed to these other uh, influences that were struggling uh, within, within the general framework of Christianity and how orthodoxy actually came to be uh, developed in triumph. Can you tell me who the Cappadocian fathers were and how St. Macrina is part of that tradition? Yeah, St. Macrina is the great Cappadocian mother, and uh, the, the saints, the two saints, Gregory and Basil the Great and uh, Chrysostom, all from the region of Cappadocia, are called the great Cappadocians or the Cappadocian fathers. Um, I dare say that uh, uh, Macrina had a very profound influence on what uh, uh, St. Gregory and St. Basil, and probably a bit of what Chrysostom, who was a friend of the family, uh, on, on, on their ultimate teachings, and even through them, had an input into the Ecumenical Council and perhaps even the final draft of the symbol of faith, the, Cap the Nicene symbol of faith. Um, you know, the St. Gregory of Nyssa, the brother of St. Macrina, when St. Macrina was dying, he knelt down beside her bed. He, re he records for us, he said, I knelt down beside the bed of the teacher to hear her last instructions. Uh, St. Basil, when he came back from studying in Athens, a bit of an arrogant little philosopher, and uh, she sort of verbally slapped him around, brought, him, brought his feet back to the ground, and made it possible in a way for him to actually make the contributions that he did. So I think we underestimate and don't venerate Saint, the great Cappadocian mother, St. Macrina, nearly as much as we should. But the Cappadocians are really... Uh, probably among the greatest philosophers and theologians in history. The understandings that they give us of not just Christ, but of the whole uh, Old Testament revelation are very profound, and they are foundational in the Christian faith. The Divine Liturgy, for example, which was edited by both Chrysostom and Basil the Great. Uh, the theology in the liturgy is their, the theology of the Cappadocians. And so many questions are answered in the prayers of the liturgy. And in the liturgy itself, uh, the, the, the knowledge that is imparted by the divine liturgy to those who pay attention to it is, is, is uh, immeasurable. It, you, you can't even value it. It's beyond value. Uh, but these, these fathers all worked together. They were under the same inspiration. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa was more mystical. He's the final editor of the Nicene Symbol of Faith. St. Basil the Great, a little more concrete. And St. John Chrysostom was the great um, moral struggler. And I, I want to say that it wasn't about moralism. It was about actual morality. Uh, for example, he re rebuked the crown prince, the Sebastocrator, for having a huge banquet of wasting food at the time when there was a uh, a great famine in the parts of Syria. Uh, and sometimes we forget that that's a moral issue. Uh, we forget that uh, the, the wealthy wasting their wealth while people are starving is a moral issue. We tend to narrow morality down to 
some kind of a, a simplistic code and not realize the greater scope of morality in our interhuman relations. The Cappadocian Fathers uh, all discuss this uh, to one degree or another. And each one has their own area of special revelation and yet they all interacted and worked together with each other. And the interesting thing is, of course, they spoke closely, closer to the, the ordinary Greek language spoken in that era, area was very close to the, the Greek of Apostle Paul, who wasn't a Greek classicalist, uh, but spoke Koine Greek, which was the, the, uh, the Greek of, of Cappadocia Anatolia. And the, the Cappadocian fathers were very familiar with that, and the uh, imagery, the metaphor, the, the, the things that Paul wrote which were locally cultural or shaped by local culture were all quite comprehensible to them. So their witnesses is quite valuable. And um, the, the uh, shaping of the liturgy um, is extremely important. It's what gives the unity of faith to the Orthodox Church. So uh, can you tell us what theosis means and which fathers might be connected to that idea? Uh, well, all of them to a certain degree because, see, the, the traditional Christian doctrine of salvation and redemption is not the uh, uh, Western Atonement doctrine. That's sort of a novel doctrine that came along after the year 1000. But the tra traditional doctrine is that Christ redeemed the fallen human nature in himself, conquered the power of death, and so we were ransomed from the power of death, liberated or, or uh, redeemed from bondage and power of Satan. And being liberated from the power of death, we could then struggle back toward immortality. Now, immortality, uh, you know, man is not naturally immortal. We don't have a, a naturally immortal soul. We're created, therefore we're not naturally immortal. Only God is naturally immortal. But theosis is, as is, is, uh, uh, Athanasius would say, God became man so that man could become God. Well, only God is immortal, and we have immortality only through our union with God. So part of, part of the whole idea of theosis is that the inner transformation of man into an image of Christ and our return to the relationship with God that gives us immortality so we share fully in the immortality of God. And being immortal, of course, we pass from being human to being divine. And uh, so really, uh, redemption is liberation from the power and bondage of death, giving us the possibility of reestablishing immortality by grace, uh, which of course means that we become divine, the theosis. And the, the liberation also, for some people in this life, a liberation from the passions that weigh us down and cause us suffering. The passion should always be understood as human suffering, but to the degree that one conquers the passions in this life, that one passes from the human level to the divine level. And um, the idea that we understand the Holy Spirit indwells in man when we prepare ourselves and open ourselves for it. So in all these ways, uh, we become really divine by divine grace. But this is why it's so important to understand the two natures of Christ, both divine and human, the two wills of Christ, both divine and human, uncommingled. Because it's the reunion of man and God in Christ Jesus that makes our salvation and our theosis possible. That man is truly united with God, but doesn't cease to be man in Christ. So this, the reason this, this uh, dogma is, is so important because that, that rescuing of the whole fallen human nature and bringing it back into the capacity to become immortal by grace and to share in the things of God, which is why saints become wonder-working, because uh, they, they share in something of, of God's power uh, through the grace of the Holy Spirit. And um, th th this, is, uh, this transfiguration, transformation of the inner human person. Now, Gregory, St. Athanasius the Great, of course, St. Gregory of Nyssa, um, St. Um, uh, Gregory Palamas, uh, above all, and uh, probably St. Simeon, the new theologian, I would say, are among the best to read to get a deeper 
grasp and understanding of it, although all the fathers touch upon it in one, to one degree or another.